This video will serve as an introduction to the nervous system. We'll look at the divisions of the nervous system, the generalized structure of a neuron, as well as the generalized structure of neuroglia. The nervous system is often divided into two general categories, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system, or the CNS, consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and thus is responsible for information processing. The peripheral nervous system is divided into two, uh, two categories, or two divisions, the afferent division and the efferent division. So you can think of the peripheral nervous system as either receiving information, that information coming from the sensory receptors that are all over our body, or information being transmitted from the CNS to the body through the peripheral, through the peripheral nervous system via the efferent division. An easy way to remember the difference between the afferent division and the efferent division is that the A of afferent is also found in the brain. So the afferent division is sending information towards the brain or towards the CNS, while the efferent division, or E, is sending information away, but be careful, it's exiting the CNS. Okay. These other divisions of the nervous system are certainly very interesting, but they don't have a lot of relevance to what we're going to study over the course of these next two weeks. Uh, you will see in other classes, um, as you continue your education in biology, some, some, more thorough, some more thorough discussion regarding the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. You may actually even have heard more about the ANS in health class. So let's look at the general structure of a typical neuron. A neuron is generally composed of three parts. Dendrites, a cell body, or the soma, and an axon. Uh, there's very little structural difference between the dendrites and the axon. Really, the dendrites and the axon are just extensions of the cell membrane that make up the cell body. Uh, sometimes it's actually even really hard to tell the difference between dendrites and the axon. Look at the picture over here as an example. So generally what scientists have decided is that the axon is the longest outgrowth uh, from the cell body, while dendrites are much shorter. Information will always be received from the dendrites, okay, be propagated along the uh, dendrite membrane, along the cell body membrane, and ultimately along the axon membrane as that information is transmitted along the cell. The question of, at that point will become what is that signal going to be sent to? Will it be sent to another neuron via a synapse? Or will it be sent to a target cell like a muscle cell or an endocrine cell uh, somewhere else in the body? Later on, we'll focus more on the myelin sheath or the myelination of some neurons. Keep in mind that not all neurons have myelin. Um, but in general, what myelin is responsible for is increasing the rate of transmission of the signal from one end of the neuron to the other, especially along the length of the axon. Uh, neurons come in lots of different shapes. Um, we're not going to have a lot of time to look at all the different shapes in which those neurons uh, exist in. But in general, again, dendrites will receive signal, a long axon will transmit that signal, and ultimately the axon will end in not dendrites but axon terminals that will allow that signal to be transmitted from one cell to the next. Um, as you'll see, some of these axons, uh, or some of these neurons, excuse me, uh, have their dendrites but then have highly branched axons. Oftentimes these axons will be found as part of interneurons that are communicating between multiple cells and this single neuron. You'll also see very elaborate patterns of uh, the dendritic extensions uh, that are growing out from that cell body um, along with that single long axon. In a case like this, this is probably a sensory neuron because the extent to which the dendritic processes are elaborated um, along the length of the cell body membrane is very, very pronounced. Uh, the position of the cell body can change as well. We're not always going to have a cell body at one end of the, end of the neuron. Okay, sometimes the, uh, the cell body can be found in um, the center, if you will, of the neuron, and thus we'll classify that uh, that neuron as a unipolar. Notice it's not unipolar because it, does, it doesn't have two ends. It's unipolar because both the dendrites and the axons merge at one pole of that cell body. Um, in the case of a bipolar neuron, which is probably a little bit more what you're accustomed to seeing, um, we have the dendrites making contact on one pole of the cell body 
and the axon leaving the other pole of the cell body. While neurons do not exist independent from other cells in the nervous system, oftentimes there are supporting cells or neuroglia that are going to be very important either in providing structural support for a neuron or, as we saw earlier, um, in increasing the rate of transmission uh, along, the, uh, along the length of a particular neuron. Within our central nervous system, it's going to be astrocytes and oligodendrocytes that will serve the primary uh, neuroglial purpose. And again, their job is to provide structural support as well as maintain the concentration of ions in and around different neurons. And we'll see why that's important a little bit later on. Uh, in general, the job of neuroglia is to provide structural support. Um, we're going to focus on this left image on the left-hand side of the screen uh, because we've seen this example before. You might remember earlier in the year we saw the blood-brain barrier um, that was composed of these astrocyte foot processes. And this was important because it provided a physical barrier between the circulatory system and the nervous system. Remember the aquaporin-4 mice that had the reduced, uh, reduced astrocytic foot swelling um, under the mutant background compared to the wild-type background? Well, here's another look at this, um, this situation, if you will. Okay, so we can see again that in the case of these neuroglia, um, they're not actually making contact with a, a neuron, but they have the same basic structures, a cell body, and these outgrowths that are serving as the, um, the structural barrier between this capillary and the rest of the nervous system. Um, there, are different, there are different types of neuroglial cells. Um, diable cells, for example, are interesting if you're studying the anatomy of the brain, but we're not going to be looking at that this year. Uh, in the case of the, of the CNS and the PNS and myelination, we're going to find oligodendrocytes in the CNS and Schwann cells in the PNS. And although structurally these cells are um, slightly different, their function is virtually identical. Their job is to form the myelin sheath around the axon of many neurons. And when I was a student, the analogy that was often used to describe the structure of neuroglial cells in relation to a neuron is that of a pig in a blanket. Now, of course, today, I don't know what a pig in a blanket is, but if you remember the good old days in elementary school and middle school where you may have had a pig in a blanket for lunch, the pig is the axon and the blanket are the layers of myelin. So notice that in this case, the cells, uh, these neuroglial cells, are actually forming a sheath that um, completely encompasses the, the axon. And that, that picture is really shown quite well over here. So what you want to imagine is that the cell, rather than many cells that you're familiar with, is actually very, very thin. And as, as it's thin, it wraps itself along the axon, providing a very protective barrier around, um, around the length of the axon. And this is going to be true whether you're looking at oligodendrocytes in the CNS or Schwann cells in the PNS. Um, this is an electron micrograph of the neuroglial cells that are making this blanket around the pig of the axon. Another look at uh, myelination. Uh, remember, not all neurons have myelin around them. Um, many do, especially in the CNS. Um, not all neurons in the PNS are going to be myelinated. Notice that when the myelin um, forms its sheath around the axon, that while the myelination of one neuroglial cell uh, is continuous along the entire length of the axon, that the myelination of the second neuroglial cell is not continuous with the first. Consequently, there are going to be very, very small microscopic nodes or locations where the myelin is not going to be completely covering the length of the axon. We call these nodes or these gaps nodes of Ranvier. They're going to be very important when we try to understand the transmission of an electrical signal along the length of the axon. So we've reached the final slide of this particular video, and this picture, this illustration, does a pretty good job showing the uh, inherent complexity that exists within the nervous system, because of course, nothing is as simple as we think it is. So this is a look at some of the different types of cells that are found in the central nervous system. We can see the cell body of a particular neuron. We can see the dendrites that are extending out from uh, that cell body, and we can see an axon that is leaving that cell body. We can also see the, uh, the myelin, which in this case has surrounded the, the axon, but has not surrounded the cell body. And in this case, we can't really see um, 
where this particular axon terminates on the next cell, whether it's a nervous system cell or a cell of the body, but we can see these other uh, terminals that are making contact with the cell body of that particular neuron. So I hope this gives you an appreciation of some of the different structures that are found within the central nervous system with a focus on the structure of neurons and neuroglia.